For those of you just logging in now, welcome to the webinar, State of the Profession, Challenges and Triumphs of Special Education. I'm pleased to introduce today's presenters, Drs. William Bogdan, Susan Fowler, and Mary Ruth Colvin. Bill Bogdan, Ed D., is a former Special Education Administrator with the Hamilton County Educational Services Center in Cincinnati, Ohio, and has spent his career focused on improving organizational systems to better serve diverse learners. Susan Fowler, PhD, is a retired professor in special education at the University of Illinois and former director of the Illinois Early Intervention Clearinghouse and Early Learning Project. Mary Ruth Coleman, PhD, is a senior scientist emeritus at the Frank Porter Graham Child Development Institute at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where she directs Project U-STARS Plus. All three of our presenters today are past presidents of CEC and members of CEC's Pioneer Division. We'd like to thank them for their dedication and tireless work as part of the steering committee of the State of the Professional Work Group. And with that, I'll turn it over to our presenters. And good afternoon, this is Bill. I uh, am very thankful uh, to and honored to be here this afternoon um, speaking with you all. And we express our appreciation for your time in working us into your schedule this afternoon during this very busy spring month as you prepare for IEPs and all the tasks that you do both in the classroom in higher ed and in administration. As we begin, we would like to express our thanks to a number of folks who really supported us over the last two and a half years throughout this project. Uh, the, the CEC board, uh, chaired by Dr. Mary Lynn Boskerton as president of CEC, has been instrumental in supporting us um, in both the approved um, the proposal, the approved proposal of our work, as well as uh, providing their ongoing support throughout this time. Executive Director Alex Graham and the full CEC staff has been incredibly supportive. We've met with them every month over these past two and a half years to get the systems right and to provide the supports that we needed throughout this time. The CEC Pioneer Division Executive Committee um, is is also um, has also been extremely um, supportive of our work. We thank them as they were instrumental in, in helping us design the proposal that we presented to the CEC board. And finally, a design team of nine very talented leaders who were with us all the way in constructing the survey and helping us design the report as well as in understanding um, the results and, and moving that forward. So we, we have lots of people to thank, and, and again, we welcome you and thank you for your ongoing support of this work and of CC. As we look at the agenda this afternoon, we are going to present this in the format that we have structured the report itself. There are four thematic areas that we will be highlighting that you see on your screen, and each of us will talk through those data uh, from the results uh, particular to these four theme areas. The fifth area is very particular to what teachers were telling us through their response to the surveys, those supports uh, that are, they need be successful in the work that they do. And finally, we will move forward with answering the question, so what? What do we do from here? How do we take the results of these surveys and apply them to the work that we all are engaged in at the school level, school district level, organizational level, as well as at the level of policy establishment at the state, provincial, and federal level? So when we think about the study itself, uh, the purpose of the study had, was twofold. One, it was to understand what the state of the profession is today, a quick set snapshot of those challenges and those opportunities that afford us um, growth and support within the profession of special education, and to also establish a basic foundational database that we can use uh, both as an organization as well as within the profession itself to move us forward. You can see that the Board of Directors approved a motion back in November 2016, and prior to that, we worked hard on developing that proposal that would, in and of itself, serve as a foundation for this work. And over those two and a half years, um, we have fulfilled the charge that was established for that work. The survey itself was developed through focus groups, through CEC convention uh, programs, as well as summer leadership activities. And through multiple iterations of a pilot testing, we were ready to go and move forward in October of 2018. 
So Susan will now share the respondents' uh, characteristics and the demographics of the survey itself. Thank you, Bill. Um, we uh, presented a survey that had 36 content questions. Many of them were Likert scale ratings of one to five and also 13 demographic questions, which allowed us to um, do quite a bit of our analysis. In terms of who responded, CEC sent a link to over 9,000 uh, members who had self-identified as special ed teachers, and those were members who were current or in the last three years involved with CEC. Um, in addition, we provided a link uh, and advertised the link um, so that uh, if other special ed teachers in the field wanted to participate, they could contact CEC and be a part of the survey. So in total, you can see that we had about 10, we had slightly more than 10,000 uh, potential respondees. And of those, uh, we had a 14.3% response rate, which is actually uh, considered a good response rate um, uh, for surveys. And in terms of who responded, um, we had responses from each of the 50 states and the District of Columbia. Uh, nearly all respondents lived in the United States. Uh, so the response rate from Canada was, um, I think, under 10. Uh, the majority of respondents um, were uh, certified in special ed, um, taught in the public schools. And as you can see, um, the majority were white and female, um, which is not atypical for our profession. I would like to note, however, that um, although it says 72% identified um, as white, we also had 15% who preferred not to identify um, what their um, characteristics were. So um, there is a, a little bit of an unknown there. In terms of the years of teaching in special education, um, you'll note that the majority of respondents um, have been teaching 10 years or more. In fact, we only had 7% um, of the respondents teaching between one to three years. So most of our participants were um, veteran teachers and very few um, in total were novice teachers. Um, in terms of where they taught, um, we had the continuum of uh, settings represented by our respondents. Um, we asked them to identify where they spent 50% or more of their time. And you can see that it was fairly evenly divided between general education, resource room, uh, and just slightly more in self-contained classrooms. 14% um, indicated other uh, responsibilities, and that included uh, both administrative roles, such as curriculum coordinator, or um, teaching in more restrictive settings, such as home-based or residential. Um, so the continuum was represented. And moving on to the next slide, um, we looked at and asked them to tell us who it was that they taught. And you can see that um, the largest response group were those who taught multiple ages, which we find is pretty common in special education, depending upon um, the um, density of the population. Um, the second largest group were primary and elementary teachers. And I would just simply like to note that we did have representation across all age groups um, in the survey. Um, where it says none in black at the bottom, um, that corresponds with those who indicated that they were um, serving in other capacities. Um, so that was um, also fairly consistent. In addition to the demographics, um, we uh, wanted to know if we could move on to the next slide. First and foremost, um, how the IEP influenced special education teachers specialized instruction. And so we um, developed several questions that asked them to reflect on how often they used the IEP and how often they modified the curriculum based on students' IEPs. As you can see in figure four, um, the highest columns are under uh, 
modifying the curriculum, which is in purple, um, uh, occurred most of the time to always. Um, and referring to the IEP occurred um, at a frequent rate of either daily or weekly. So in total, close to 70% of our special education teachers frequently, um, most of the time are always modified curriculum and um, over well over 50% referred to the IEP on at least a weekly, if not a daily basis. Um, as you can see on the left side of the figure, it was a very low number who um, stated that they never looked at the IEP, which of course is a relief because um, if the IEP is what guides our instruction, we would hope that it is referred to frequently by our teachers. In the next slide, you can see that um, we also asked teachers or the respondents to consider um, the extent to which they believe they were well prepared, um, extremely or, or, or very well prepared. And this was on a Likert scale of one to five with very being a four and extremely being a five. So we combined all of those responses that provided a four or a five on the scale and our respondents who were um, answering the survey, the majority of them, 69%, felt that they were very to extremely well prepared to teach students um, using the IEP to reach their IEP goals. And an equivalent number were also uh, rating, they rated their related service providers, our respondents, as also um, very to extremely well prepared. So the majority of related service providers uh, received high ratings. Um, they were um, not quite as uh, positive about um, their special ed colleagues, but again, it was more than 50% who thought that their colleagues were very to extremely well prepared. And um, they were, I guess you could say, more critical of their novice colleagues who were out only one to three years with, um, 38% saying that new teachers were extremely or very well uh, prepared. Um, the concern from the survey that we'd like to highlight is that many of the respondents, or very few of the respondents, I guess I should say, thought that their paraeducators were well prepared or extremely prepared. And um, likewise, a uh, few of them thought that their general education colleagues were very well prepared to um, teach students to reach their IEP goals. And I'd like to be clear here, they weren't saying that their colleagues were not well prepared to teach, but we specifically said well prepared to teach students to reach IEP goals. So there's quite a drop off as we um, move to paraeducators and general education colleagues Although, um, interestingly, they thought their novice education colleagues were slightly more prepared than their more veteran colleagues. Moving on to the next slide, uh, we wanted to know not only how prepared they felt to use the IEP, but did they have sufficient time um, to plan their lessons, to plan with uh, their teaching partners, and that would specifically be if they were co-teaching or teaching with a paraprofessional? And did they have sufficient time uh, to teach with their IEP team members? So those who are on the IEP, uh, working with them on the IEP. And you can see that we've circled the right side of the figure um, where um, only a small percentage of our participants said, yes, we have sufficient time. So only one in five thought they had enough time to plan their lessons. Um, they did not feel they had sufficient time, um, or the major, uh, very few thought that they had sufficient time to plan with partners, teaching partners. And one in 10 said they had sufficient time to plan with IEP team members. And this, of course, um, is concerning. We, we asked them to rate um, the extent to which they had no time, 
some time, but insufficient and sufficient time. And uh, as you can see, the two figures that are lowest are no time and sufficient time. So raises a concern about um, the way in which the system in which teachers um, work um, supports the use of the IEP and using it as a planning document. Um, moving to the next slide, I think the key takeaways that we take on the I, about the IEP from our nearly 1,500 respondents is that um, they value the IEP. Um, they use it frequently. Um, they use it to modify curriculum, um, but um, they are concerned that uh, they don't have enough time to engage in planning um, with their IEP team um, and actually planning with their with their partners. Um, they also don't feel that their um, partners who are in general education or their paraeducators are very well prepared to assist them in teaching to the IEP. Now, interestingly, we did a deeper dive on the data and we don't have this presented in a slide, but when we looked at teachers who reported that they taught in self-contained classrooms um, versus teachers who reported that they were in resource rooms um, or in general education, that um, it was the um, teachers in the self-contained classrooms who said they, who, who responded that they had um, significantly more time to um, use the IEP and modify curriculum than those in the general education classroom. So again, this goes back to the issue of needing um, in general education more time to work with, with um, the IEP and to plan. And it may also reflect um, that oftentimes teachers in self-contained classrooms have a smaller caseload than teachers who are um, charged with collaborating in the general education environment, um, whether through resource room or through co-teaching um, in general ed. So the takeaway that we have from this is um, what we saw 20 years ago in a prior study, that teachers need more time um, to work with the IEP. Mary Ruth, would you like to take the next set of findings? Sure. Thank you, Susan. And when we um, looked next in the survey, we looked at teachers' feelings of competence using recommended practices. The recommended practices that we looked at included assessments, instruction, and included looking at classroom management and disciplinary strategies. Teachers' feeling of competence was a marker for their ability to meet students' needs within their classrooms and their sense of, I can do this. I can do this with success. This is good news for us as a field. Teachers feel relatively competent in using assessment strategies. We can see from figure seven that there's a strong sense of competence in meeting IEP goals, that they feel competent in using observational data, in using progress monitoring kinds of data, and in using formal assessment kinds of data. We see, though, that using strength-based assessments is not an area that our teachers report feeling as competent and that high stakes testing is also an area where they might feel a little less competent in assessing student learning and student readiness for learning. Sampling for portfolios falls kind of in between all of those areas at 65% competence. This competence in using assessment data is important because the assessment data frames the instructional practices. And so what we see next is confident, competence in instructional practices. And again, this is a, a pretty good picture for us in special education. Our teachers feel most competent around differentiated instruction, and they report pretty high levels of um, competence within their ability to differentiate their instruction to help their students reach success. We see personalized learning as another area where teachers feel competent. 
Universal design for learning, we see less competence there, self-reported competence from the teachers. And then we see that half of our teachers report being very or extremely competent in culturally relevant strategies for instruction, which is a red flag because that means that almost half of our teachers don't rate themselves as highly competent in this area. Again, on the competence figures, it's a Lakehart scale with five points, and we have combined very to extremely competent as we look at the levels of competence for the slides, the same and for the teachers. The other area where teachers feel a little less competent or report feeling a little less competent is with high leverage practices. As the team reviewed this finding, we weren't sure whether or not the very words high leverage practices were perhaps not as well known by our teaching population. These are relatively new terms used to denote teaching practices that have an evidence base for showing effectiveness at a fairly high level with students with special learning needs. Many of our teachers probably are more familiar with some individual strategies that are identified as high level practices, but they may not actually be as familiar with the term high level practices. And we think that that perhaps would require some additional professional development to help teachers understand what high level leverage practices actually are. So overall, with instructional practices, teachers report high levels of competence. Areas of concern, however, are with culturally relevant strategies and again with high leverage practices. When we think about teachers' feelings of competence using organizational practices. This was also pretty good news. We see that coordinating with paraprofessionals, teachers feel pretty competent, using flexible grouping, and using problem-solving teams. A little bit less sense of competence using learning centers, and again we drop down to almost half of our teachers only feeling very or extremely competent with co-teaching. And that means that almost half of our teachers don't feel as competent, very or extremely competent with co-teaching. Again, when we thought about this as a team, we feel like co-teaching takes a little more of an infrastructure at the school level and the district level, and that this is a, a model that has to be very intentionally infused within the um, teaching arena for teachers to feel competent with this. So we think that if, if schools want to be using co-teaching, they need to invest in the preparation and in the support that teachers need for co-teaching. And this goes back to what Susan was saying also in, in discussing figure six, time for planning and time available to work with colleagues. And so it may be that teachers' competence, sense of competence around co-teaching is related to their feeling of lack of time in terms of planning with their colleagues. The next area that we looked at was the use of disciplinary strategies. And this again had some things to celebrate and feel really good about and some other areas that we think are still challenging. When asked about the disciplinary strategies that teachers use, they had a fairly wide repertoire of things they could go to. Quiet space, brief timeouts, using positive behavior intervention, using behavior supports, and also office referrals. Those came out at a, a relatively high level of, um, I feel pretty competent using these. We see this competence, self-reported competence, drop down again when we think about functional behavior assessments and drop down more, much more when we think about culturally responsive practices. This one we found very troubling because in addition to what we're showing in figure 10, we also know that some schools report using expulsion and using um, suspensions. And 
we know from other information that the rates of expulsion and, and suspension are higher for children of color. And when we combine that with teachers feeling less competent around culturally responsive disciplinary strategies, we think we have some work to do as a field. And this, again, will be highlighted when we think about what is it we can do to better support our teachers as they work with a very diverse and increasingly diverse population. So what are some of the key takeaways from teacher competence in terms of recommended practices? Well, we can feel pretty good that teachers rate themselves as very to extremely competent in the use of most practices, most of the assessment practices, most of the instructional practices, as well as the disciplinary practices and classroom management practices. However, the areas that we really need to think about are culturally relevant practices, the use of strength-based approaches, approaches, and the use of high leverage practices. So while we have some triumphs and we can feel very good about our teacher's level of competence, we also have some challenges and those challenges will need to be addressed. My uh, colleague Susan is going to talk about family engagement and the role of family engagement. Thank you, Mary Ruth. Um, we were very interested in finding out the extent to which um, our special education teacher respondents felt that they um, had district support for family engagement and IEP involvement. And again, um, the extent to which they they um, felt that they had adequate time to engage with families. And as you can see on the figure um, in front of you, family engagement, 42% um, of the teachers reported that they were very to extremely comfortable in um, receiving district support um, to um, engage with families. So 42% of the teachers said that their district supported them quite well. Um, but that means um, on the reverse that more than almost 60% did not feel um, extremely or very well supported. Um, and in fact, uh, a number 40%, which is not present on this slide, said that um, they were receiving only minimal support or no support from their district. So this speaks to, again, a systems issue of providing ample opportunity and time and uh, resources for engaging families. When we specifically asked about uh, district support for family involvement in the IEP, a smaller percentage of teachers said that they received from their district um, um, high levels of support. Um, we asked them um, what kind of support that um, they needed or should receive, and about 900 of our respondents um, wrote in um, comments for support issues, um, as well as identifying the issue of more time to contact families and to schedule I IEPs. They also noted the need for supports to assist families in transportation to attend the IEPs, uh, support for flexible scheduling outside of um, typical school hours. Um, and um, an interesting comment that was raised by quite a few of the respondents was that um, they also wanted to be included in conferences that involved the general education teacher and the parents, that it was difficult for them to be left out of that loop and um, that it was important that they be included in those parent-teacher conferences. Um, another area in which they noted a need for support was having adequate access to interpreters and translators. Um, and uh, they raised concerns over um, the unmet needs of families uh, that 
often interfered with the family's ability to engage with the school, such as families who were struggling with shelter, food, and employment. So it's a complex picture, and it's not a picture that says straightforwardly that districts need to do more. I think it's a picture that says teachers recognize that engaging with families is a complex endeavor, and in order to do it successfully, they need a variety of supports and resources and um, would like more to be available from, from the district level. We then asked families if we could move to the next slide, or rather we asked teachers um, what their confidence was in engaging with families who differed from them in terms of socioeconomic level, ethnicity, and language. And not surprisingly, um, the lowest level of confidence had to do with families, engaging with families who spoke a language that differed from the primary language of the teacher or who spoke a language that the teacher did not speak. So um, as we see an increase in um, children, students who are second um, language learners and English is their second or sometimes even third language, teachers are indicating that um, uh, the language differences without the support of translators um, or cultural brokers um, makes it makes makes them um, makes them feel less confident in engaging with families. Um, it's also of importance to note that um, uh, only 43% and 37% were highly confident in engaging with families who differed from them in terms of socioeconomic level or race and ethnicity, that cultural and economic variables um, presented for some of our teachers a challenge. And I think, again, in the commentaries that they provided um, in terms of the socioeconomic level, many raised issues of difficulties um, meeting with families due to transportation or um, due to the fact that families were struggling to meet basic needs. And in terms of ethnicity and race, um, we had an issue that families, that teachers noted that they um, did not always understand the uh, cultural um, issues that families may um, present um, or that they weren't well prepared for the diversity of cultures represented by their students. Um, some reported in their comment sections that their schools were engaging in a variety of activities to support diversity in their schools, such as having um, special celebrations and activities um, at the school level um, to uh, uh, address um, diverse cultures. They mentioned specifically um, having a diversity council cultural liaisons. Um, they also noted um, that in some cases their schools were working on ways to offer opportunities for family to participate by providing social activities um, and also by referring families who indicated a need to other community agencies. So again, what, what our conversation with, or our, our, our survey with teachers around the issue of families tells us in terms of takeaway, if we could move to the next slide, is that, um, oops, sorry, the next slide is student sense of belonging. We also asked teachers um, not only how they, um, how comfortable they were or confident they were with families, but to what extent did they feel that their um, students um, had a sense of belonging in the school? And this certainly gets to the essence of inclusion and, um, uh, and, and the extent to which teachers feel that they are competent and confident in um, a variety of issues. And what we see is that the majority do, do estimate um, that students have a strong sense of belonging 
most of the time or half of the time, if you look at the blue and green section of the diagram. Um, and again, when we did a deeper dive into the data, um, it was the teachers who taught in general education and who taught in resource rooms that um, were more likely to identify sense of belonging as most of the time or at least half of the time or always compared to um, teachers in self-contained classrooms. So our key takeaways um, on family engagement is that um, teachers were less confident about engagement with families than any other topic on the survey. And part of that engagement um, uh, appeared to be related to uh, demographic differences with the families, some of the families they served. Um, it also related to wishing uh, for more support to work with families, which again reflected back on an issue of having time and resources um, to engage with families. Um, an issue to celebrate, I believe, is that the majority of teachers feel that students have a sense of belonging in uh, the settings in which they're served. And again, not surprisingly, that sense of belonging was strongest um, or more frequently identified um, when students were served in the general education classroom more than 50% of the time um, and in the resource room uh, than in the self-contained classroom. So again, some system level, district level issues um, that teachers face um, that go beyond the classroom and maybe even the local school when um, addressing uh, uh, family who are the key partners for um, children with exceptionalities because as we know, families are the ones who are with, the, with their children uh, the majority of the time and over time. So um, an issue to consider as we, we look into the future. Um, Bill, system levels issues? Uh, yes, thank you, Susan. We moved away from the level of competence teachers were feeling about the practices in which they were engaged towards the understanding of systems level supports, asking teachers how much service they felt they received in support from their building as well as district level administration. And the first question we asked was related to their skill set in collaboration and what types of supports they felt they were receiving from their administration to support their collaboration um, within, within the structures of their buildings. If we consider this slide and moving um, from the right to the left, we know that for a long, long period of time, we've had um, deep conversations, philosophical conversations, and values-based conversations about how students with disabilities are welcomed and included within our schools. So we did not feel it was surprising that over 60% of our um, special education teachers who were interviewed or surveyed felt that <clears throat> inclusion in general education was a value space that was embraced by their school and their district. As we think about the next two bars in this graph, we really are looking at systems that are um, integrated and put in place that look at a building in the context of the entire building. We know that in many states, positive behavior intervention supports are now being mandated within guidelines um, promoted by states, as well as being embedded within um, multi-tier systems of support. So we heard from our teachers that approximately 50% of them uh, surveyed felt that there were good levels of support uh, across um, our schools uh, around multi-systems of support that were inclusive of positive behavior and intervention supports. Uh, we assumed then that their involvement within um, establishing those uh, guidelines and those structures in a collaborative way with their general education and, relate, and related service professionals was intact. Obviously, there is room for continuing growth in that area, but 50%, close to 50%, were feeling that the system was in place for that. 
Reflecting back on a slide that um, Mary Ruth was addressing around teachers feeling competent in uh, the act of co-teaching, um, research-based, evidence-based practice of co-teaching, it doesn't surprise us too much that in regard to what teachers felt about receiving it, um, support around that collaboration, recognizing that, that timing and planning and collaboration uh, becomes a bit of an issue, we also know that um, this, in many cases, gets down to specific role clarification and definition for both general educators as well as special educators. So um, from this slide and from the, um, these survey results, we find that there still is quite a lot of work to be done, quite a lot of challenges as it relates to how co-teaching is embraced within a building, how well our staff members, both general education and special education uh, staff members are trained, and what kinds of support they are provided to promote collaboration, both in planning time as well as within um, the structures of special education job responsibilities within a consultation model or co-teaching within the general education classroom. The second area of support that we were looking at was what levels of support, we find this in the next slide, what levels of support would um, teachers need to enhance their teaching, um, their teaching skills themselves. If you look at the center two uh, bars on this, um, these 50% uh, um, of our teachers were expressing that ongoing professional development and consultation from different uh, levels of support were occurring within their buildings, be it uh, related to their principals or special education uh, departments at central office or the ongoing professional development that's embedded within, within their schools. Coupled with that, at the 38%, we see the emergence of teachers' availability for online resource um, development and resource uh, training, um, either through organizations like the Council for Exceptional Children or what work, work, Works Clearinghouse or other opportunities for technical support that they would um, receive from online services. When we think about um, actual body-to-body -body support, as reflected, for example, in mentoring and coaching, um, surprisingly a little bit that, again, a systems approach to this would require that there would be um, individual professionals who would be within their job description identified in providing the support for coaching as well as mentoring. And so we see that as a challenge the opportunity from a systems perspective to build this into the system of support still needs to be investigated. When we look at problem solving teams um, all the way over to the right, in some cases problem solving teams are built within systems of improvement um, as it relates to school improvement strategies embraced within a building or a district. And less so, we see that the natural progression of support through communities of practice has received the lo lowest level of support. Understanding that we may naturally see this occurring um, by a group of teachers who um, congregate together um, to support one another, but less supported at a um, building or district level as a programmatic or systematic way of supporting teachers in, in their work and development. When we then turn to the um, support and preparation for um, understanding the role of the IEP in the instructional program, we asked the question as to how teachers felt their administrators, both at the building and district level, were prepared to actually support the enactment and the carrying out of IEP goals, objectives, and the program built on those, um, on those IEPs. Not surprisingly, we had over 50% response stating that there was a feeling of good support uh, provided by their special education uh, administrators, special education supervisors, whatever level that would, um, would be within their district, less so from the building principal or from the district general education administrator. This is not to suggest that um, the general education administrators are less equipped or less prepared. Part of this is the responsibility of um, who manages and who um, has responsibility for carrying out the IEP. 
and that balance between the role of the special education administrator at the district level versus that of general education administrator or the role of the building principal um, either needs to be clarified or again a general understanding of the system support and the responsibility of each of the administrators in supporting a teacher's work in carrying out um, the IEP and the importance of the IEP in special education services. We next turned um, to the role um, of evaluation and critical components of evaluation in particular to the role of special education and special educators in the classroom. So the question was, what topics do you feel need to be in, embedded within evaluation of my performance and what topics are already embedded within the system. So if you think about the yellow bars, we're asking for what is being, re what is being reported in evaluation versus the green bars, which reflect what I feel as a special educator should be looked at. When you look across um, these, uh, this graph and these bars, you'll find, again, that it's not surprising that quality of instruction is certainly something that we would, uh, we would recognize. 92% um, of the teachers saying that this is embedded, um, and at least 80% of those also identifying that it does need to uh, look at that. Where we find that the, the shortcoming in this whole area of evaluation is actually the role of the IEP. How does the IEP inform instruction and how does the IEP then um, out of its um, use for, for that instruction appear in the evaluation of my performance as a special education teacher? And so we see that 70% of those teachers feel it, it has a very significant role knowing from a special education practice that the IEP has an instrumental um, role in, in the quality of instruction but less so reported that it actually does occur, that the person doing the evaluation actually would look at the IEP and understand the role the IEP has. So we see that there is definitely a distinction between what uh, teachers feel the IEP should be in the role of evaluation as opposed to what it is. We also see that there is a distinction between high stakes assessment and high stakes um, state level assessments. Part of this is um, related to a perspective from the teacher, um, that uh, special education teacher who goes back to the understanding of the role of the IEP and the balance between the expectation that the IEP is driven off of the general education curriculum to meet the standard of high stakes assessment and then what is actually reflected in the evaluation. And so we see that there's a discrepancy there between each of those. When we, when we looked at um, how effective as an evaluation mechanism um, in teacher evaluation, um, working collaboratively with uh, related service and other general education um, and other personnel as well as families, we see that there is a fairly close expectation that it does need to be evaluated and it's perceived to be um, needed to be evaluated by special education teachers as well as it being evaluated within the system. Working effectively um, is less so um, uh, seen as a, a component of evaluation and more so in the role of, of, of effective collaboration expected by special education teachers. When we look across the board, we also know that evaluation systems are built within the context of the entire school system and within the building itself. So the discrepancies that we see in some cases are subtleties and maybe in some cases not so subtle in what teachers perceive as an expectation they hold for things like the role of the IEP, for the ability to collaborate, for the ability to understand the, the, the distinction between high stakes assessment and the role of the IEP in driving instruction, and within the system of evaluation that is in some cases generic across the district itself. So when we think about the key takeaways around administrative support reflected on the next slide. Um, the administrative support provided um, both around collaboration as well as practice. We know that nearly half of our respondents reported that good collaborative practices are evident within, our, within schools, but fewer teachers rated 
that their non-special education district uh, administrators were as well prepared as they would hope they would be as it relates to the role of the IEP and the IEP outcomes. Some of this is a challenge as it relates to how who has responsibility for understanding and managing the IEP and what do others, professionals within those buildings have as it relates to understanding the impact the IEPs have as it relates on the, the quality of instruction as well as the evaluation system. We know that there are a range of professional, professional development opportunities affording us and that um, again in the, in the actual evaluation of performance, IEP goals stands out much as it did in other um, questions that we asked around competencies and the role of the IEP in directing instruction. So the next section we were looking at is the identification by teachers of what they feel they need most in support of, of their work. And Mary Ruth will talk about this. We just decided that if we wanted to know what teachers valued most and felt they needed most in order to be successful with their students, we should ask them. We developed a set of 10 options from our focus groups and from our piloted survey data. And those 10 options were presented to the teachers. The teachers were asked to take three of those and indicate that these three are the ones that are most essential to me if I'm going to be successful with my students. These are the three that I will go to the mat for. So what were the top three things that our teachers asked for? When we asked them what they needed to be successful, the number one response was adequate resources to meet the IEP requirements for my students. If I'm expected to differentiate the curriculum, help me by giving me the tools, by giving me the, the strategies, and by giving me examples as well as curriculum that is differentiated. If I'm expected to use a variety of strategies to help my students meet those IEP goals, which I am and which I hold myself accountable for, please make sure that I have the resources that I need in order to do my job well. The second thing that our teachers asked for was smaller class sizes and case loads. The teachers indicated that if they are, and they feel they are, responsible for making sure their students are successful, then the numbers really do matter. The numbers of teachers that I have to collaborate with, if I have a caseload that requires me to co-teach or interface with my students within general education settings, the class size, if I have a classroom of my own students, the teachers indicated that the numbers make a difference in terms of their ability to better plan for, better collaborate, and better interface with students and families to help them um, reach success for their students. The number three thing that teachers said they need to be successful, and this relates directly back to what Bill was talking about in figure uh, 15 and 16, administrators who support that IEP process. It also relates back to that sense of administrators who understand and are knowledgeable about the IEP process, particularly if they are the ones who are evaluating my success in teaching. So the top three things that teachers asked for were resources for the IEP, manageable class sizes and case loads, and administrators who really understand what they're doing in terms of meeting the individual education needs of their students. The other options that teachers had to respond to, shown in their rank order, show that the other eight options were knowledgeable paraeducators. And when we think about the number of teachers who actually asked for knowledgeable paraeducators, we dropped down to 395. Principals as a strong instructional leader, and that relates back to that notion of a principal who understands what I'm doing and understands the complexity of the job that I've been asked to do. 323 teachers ranked that as number, and that became number five. Professional development to help me do this job and do it well. 
295 teachers picked that as one of their top three. Reduced paperwork, 292 pick that as one of their top three. Access to related service providers, 280 selected that as one of their top three. Access to technology drops down to 165. And that's probably a good thing because we took that as a sign to mean that many teachers have access to technology. And the 10th was general education curriculum and access to that curriculum. So when we think about what teachers need to be successful and what they're asking for, our key takeaways kind of are framed out by the notion that teachers affirm the importance of the IEP and the resources they need to reach those IEP goals. They affirm that size of class and caseload really do matter and that the support of administrators is critical to them in terms of being successful. And Bill is going to share with us some of the next steps for using the information that the teachers have shared with us to make sure that the teachers' voices are not lost and that we, in fact, listen to and act on what they've told us is important to them. Thank you, Mary Ruth. In closing out this afternoon's presentation, we wanted to spend just a couple minutes talking about what's next. So what? So what does this information tell us? What does this survey information and the response of our teachers tell us about how we might move forward? We know that there are three critical areas that are always um, in the purview of the work of uh, the Council for Exceptional Children. Three broad areas, three goal areas that look at professional development and the establishment of standards for the profession. The role that CEC has in policy development at both state, provincial, as well as federal levels, and how CEC advocates for and influence policy development at those levels. And third, um, programs and practices related to the profession itself. So when we go back to the intent and the purpose of this study, we really were looking at understanding what this current status of the state of the profession is for special education. But what we learned from what teachers were telling us about how we advance and move forward, what are the implications for what we do around professional development and what areas of professional development do we want to look at um, in enhancing as well as establishing. How do we continue to inform policy at all the levels, uh, both, both um, at our district level as well as uh, state or provincial, and then moving to our federal level through the work of CEC, and then within programs and practices within, within, our, um, within our systems. As we think about how we move this forward, here is where we are. Our report itself is in the final edits. That report will be available to you in the near future. As uh, we said in the introduction, we've organized our report uh, around these four uh, thematic areas, as well as the area addressed by Mary Ruth and what teachers were telling us as to the needs that they have. Also, in the September-October edition of Teaching Exceptional Children, there will be an extensive article built from um, the report um, that will be addressing the outcomes. Where we are now is in planning where we develop our partnerships. Uh, we have a strong relationship within CEC among um, the state and provincial units as well as the divisions. And this uh, work will continue to be uh, embedded in those conversations at summer leadership as well as our conventions, as well as opportunities within the conversations uh, designed around those units as they think about how they either work within their own context of states and provinces or within the discipline areas of uh, the uh, divisions themselves. We're looking at partnerships with organizations such as NASDI, the National Association of State Directors of Special Education, the Elementary and Secondary Principals Association, the Association of um, Superintendents and Administrators. We are also looking at how to interface with um, the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitation Services as well as the Office of Special Education Programs at the federal level. So we are not stopping here. We see this as the opportunity, as a springboard, and as the foundation that moves us forward as an organization as well as how you um, become um, 
uh, a, a key player in taking this forward within the environments that uh, in which you work, either at the pre-service level or the professional level of uh, teacher development based on the standards that are established by CEC, as well as within your school buildings and school districts or within the professional associations you interact with, such as CEC or others. So again, we thank you for being with us this afternoon. We look forward to the future and possibly working with you as um, you embrace and understand what teachers are telling us about the state of our profession. All right, thank you everyone. We've got um, just time for just a few questions. So I'm going to start with this one. Um, this, Susan, this goes back to when you were talking about figure four using the IEP as a reference point and modifying curriculum. Does that modification refer to content materials such as adjusting the level for students who might have um, intellectual disability or modifying the format, which is made accessible for students with visual impairments. Did folks um, give that information in their responses? Um, they responded only that they were that they were frequently modifying the curriculum. They didn't um, have an opportunity to comment on in what way they were modifying it. So I, I think it, it probably deals with both form and function, um, the modifications to um, meet the individualized learning needs of the, of the student. All right, thank you. And then I, I'm sure a lot of this is probably in the full report that Bill just talked about that we're working on finalizing will be available to everyone. Um, was there demographic question asking about suburban, urban, rural districts in which the teachers are serving? Um, yes, they're, they're, we did ask that, and um, uh, that's uh, a point in the survey that we um, have not done uh, cross, cross analysis with the responses. Um, there was a fairly even distribution across the um, urban, suburban, and rural. Whether those mean difference in the responses, we can't tell you yet. I know that there is, there's quite a lot of data. As you guys saw, this was just an hour, and this is only some of the information that's contained in the full report and some of the information that we can use as we're moving forward. As Bill said, working with professional development, working with policy, working with programming, teacher preparation, there's a whole lot of opportunity here. We want to thank all of you who shared your responses. And I especially want to thank our presenters here today who took the time out to share all this information with us and who are working so hard on all of the other materials. Um, for those of you who have other questions, unfortunately, we're about out of time, but we will have an opportunity to ask some questions once the full report comes out. And you always have the all member forum as a resource as well. That's a great place to kind of get, now that you have the information about what teachers are looking for, to get ideas on how you can actually implement that in your own work. So with that, I'm going to end our recording and thank you 